I'm talking today with Conscious Bravery author Pamela Brinker. And I love the title, but I also love the cover art, Vibrant Red Poppy with a Bleak Background. Why was that chosen? I helped design that cover with my publisher and the graphics artist because I wanted to convey how we are walking alongside those we care about in a wilderness. The wilderness of substance use and mental health challenges feels overwhelming at times. And so that's why I wanted, there's a canyon. If you really look at the cover, there's a canyon there as well. Mm -hmm. But I wanted the poppy because, Pat, it is a, it's a powerful image. Poppies are so resilient. They'll grow anywhere in the most inhospitable places. And as I'm sure you probably know and your listeners know, poppies are the plant from which opiates are made. And so I wanted there to be some symbolic meaning to that. My husband didn't like the poppies in our front yard, so he took most Mm. of them out. And guess what? They they sprang up in another (laughs) spot in the front yard on the other side of the fence. So That's what happens with relapse or with those we love who have mental health challenges, they just keep coming back. You know, they may feel like they've kind of gotten what may be um, depression under control, but then six years later, it kind of resumes and rears its painful head again. So we have to become resilient in order to be able to walk alongside them and support them. Do you believe that certain people are born with more bravery than others. I I get throughout the book that you think we can all cultivate additional bravery. It's really helpful when each of us look inside and say, what bravery do I have? Because we are all born with the seeds of bravery, just like we're born with the seeds of love, but we need to tend to them and develop them. And, And that's what bravery training is. It's really an ability to learn how to flow with all of the challenges in life and bring in, uh, just like with love, bring in assertiveness when it's needed, but also bring in tender compassion as needed. You have two sons and both of them struggled with addiction. What were you doing in your life when you had your kids and then later when they became adults and the basis of your book happened? I was married to my two sons father for 21 years and that marriage ended and then I remarried a beautiful man and six and a half years later he died from grade four glioblastoma brain cancer oh my goodness I'm so sorry so sorry thank you it's what happens we're not promised anything in this life and most of us get sick and all of us will die eventually and so so at any rate at that time it just knocked me off my feet and I was devastated and my son unbeknownst to me, we're dealing with their grief and pain with much more difficulty than I was aware of. We had a really open communication, I thought, but they they didn't want to burden me with how difficult things were, were for them as they were grieving. And so they turned to each other and they turned to drugs and alcohol. So they began using alcohol and drugs and hallucinogens and stimulants. And within three, four years, they were both addicted to methamphetamine. And so I had to as a psychotherapist, use all the tools and practices I had taught my clients and in workshops and morph them into things that worked for me so that I could really be there for them and wake up and help change our family system so that we could address what was going on. Because substance use issues and mental health challenges, they don't just belong to the person that has them. We operate in systems and collectives. And so it was our whole family system that needed to, to shift. You had a lot of challenges, or they had a lot of challenges with homelessness, violence, and even jail time. And that isn't unusual, of course. It's not. It is so challenging because those who struggle with substance use and alcohol use want to be clean and sober. They want lives that aren't rising and falling according to cravings and relapses or panic attacks and the impulsivity that comes with ADHD. No one wants that. No one wants to have a mental health challenge or to become dependent upon a substance. And so when that would happen, I would say, hey, I'm here with you. What can we do? What do you need? And to be honest for them meant admitting that they would want treatment. And lots of times people aren't ready for treatment. They're not ready for residential or detox or anything. And so I would say, well, I'm here for you. You can live in our house. But they would know that it was going to be a challenge to be here in my home. 
And so they would, they would leave. They would choose homelessness or they would get kicked out of their apartments because their roommates <laughs> couldn't stand what was happening. <laughs> they, I can't do this anymore. So they would choose homelessness. And, and that happened to both of them. And it, it's just gut wrenching and hard. So then I would invite them over. I'd say, Hey, you're welcome to come here for a meal. And that's really the true love that I had to learn, the unconditional, non-judgmental love that I think all of us need to bring into the world of recovery is to be there for the people that we care about, even when they're not clean. How do you, especially as a psychotherapist, deal with that? You said you invited them over for meals and you talk about that in the book. Do you just Mm -hmm. deal with the here and now? You're here eating a steak and how are you? Remember that time when we went camping? I mean, how do you deal with them in that moment? And then how do you let them go to leave the house to goodness knows what? Uh, Exactly what you said, being present with them. I had to learn that the hard way, being present with them and receptive and not necessarily talking with them when they would be over for a meal, not necessarily talking with them about their substance use. In fact, I found that that would make them leave. (laughs) So I just tried to bring them joy and offer kindness and be the tall tree that I can be so that they would want that too. You know, I find that we as mothers and parents forget that when we can role model our capacity to be consciously brave, then it helps our loved ones to know, wow, maybe they can do it too. And so I had to learn not to be thrown off by and completely brought to the ground by their use or whatever was going on with them in their world. I needed to have the ability to sustain tender compassion and and refine my balance over and over and over again and cultivate contentment so that I could really bring the, the offerings they needed depending on whatever they needed. You hear often about tough love, that parents give their kids tough love, which they interpret to mean sometimes you stand back and you don't help. Did you ever try tough love? I tried everything. I tried. (laughs) Yes, absolutely. I tried tough love in the beginning because it was recommended by one of the groups I was a part of at the time, but it doesn't work. Tough love to me, and I started researching this more and and listening to some of my other friends who had actually lost sons, Mm -hmm. partly because of tough love concepts. People can die. Not everyone's rock bottom is the same. There's not a one size fits all approach to recovery or approach to walking alongside someone we we love. And so I had to learn what I'm willing to do and what I'm not willing to do, what I want to do and what I don't want to do, and to be boundaried with unconditional love. And that works so much better. Does that involve, you said walking along with your loved one, does that involve your life stopping while theirs hits the rocks? Or do you also, when you talk about pursuing your own happiness, does that happen also for you as this is occurring? Yes. Protecting and pursuing our own happiness is crucial, not just for ourselves, but for those we care about who are seeking recovery. And I did not put everything on hold. I learned to continue to go on a vacation and to get away for a weekend, see my girlfriends, go out and hear one of my best friends who's a singer and laugh because I wanted to bring that vibrant happiness into my own world and into my son's world. And that vibrancy is part of what I what I mean when I talk about the consciousness and bravery, because our vibrancy gives us the capacity to handle and hold our deep pain while we're also able to guard and keep our contentment. And so no, I didn't I didn't put my life on hold and I don't regret it because I think it's part of why I'm a, people tell me I'm a joyous person and, and I have that capacity because I can hold opposites and I teach that. I teach that to my clients and in workshops that we want to be able to hold flip sides of the same coin, be able to be strong and tender. It must have been tough when you were on vacation with your friends in Hawaii and one of your sons or both of your sons was going through something at that time, but yet you did go to Hawaii. How did you keep it together or or wasn't it hard for you? Were you able to pursue happiness in that way and yet be a good mom? It was really hard. And that trip had been planned months prior or I probably wouldn't have gone. But it was a trip planned to get away with my one of my dearest friends and her partner and my husband. And while we were there, I would get phone calls from both of my sons and they would shake my world for a little bit. But then I would remember, hey, they have their own lives and they're making these choices and that's going to help them build their own resiliency. 
And so I really tried, especially during that vacation, to convey to them my confidence in them, that they could do this, they could do whatever was needed, and to take it one moment at a time. And that's the present that I believe that I was able to kind of role model for them. Practice that when my sons would call me on the phone. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I mm-hmm. would just say, okay, I'm right here. You know, in my own head and heart, I'd say, I'm right here. I've got to be grounded. I want to tap into what's greater. And then I could convey that and listen to them on the phone. And that's, I think, an offering that we forget as parents. And it's part of why our self-care is so crucial that our loved ones pick up on how we're doing and it can impact them. And if they know we're doing all right, then they know they can at some point do all right as well. Had you not gone on that Hawaiian trip, look at all you would have missed. And if that was your thinking, you would miss the next trip and the following trip and the trip after that, I think, right? You wouldn't make the plans. My favorite phrase of the book was, now there's this. Whenever there's a new challenge or a a new wrinkle (laughs) crops up. And people, people really do, as you point out in the book, people really do tend to, something new crops up, a new challenge that sometimes changes everything. But people want to go back to what was before. And that doesn't usually happen anymore, does it? It doesn't. And you've got it, Pat. It's so easy for us to to want to say, oh, gosh, let's go back to the new normal. And that's not possible. I don't even know. And most of us know that there wasn't really a normal. There was just mm. a period of time that we kind of liked where we liked what was happening. And we want to just kind of keep everything that way. But that never happens. Just as we get things the way we want them to be, sure enough, something falls in our lap or on our plate. Yeah. And challenges don't usually come one at a time. I've found they usually come in, in more than threes. And so, right. The now there's this approach is a way to live in the present moment. We can say, okay, wow, this has arrived. Oh, I'm feeling shocked or I'm feeling devastated. My son relapsed or oh, my daughter's hanging out with someone from the treatment program who has gone off the rails. The other circumstances that we're all facing on this planet right now, that can really just knock us off our feet. And so we need skills and methods. And I found that saying, now there's this, all right, huh, now there's this. And I might, (laughs) I'll walk around my house or around my office and I'll put my arms around myself, kind of wrapping my arms in a hug and I'll feel my feet on the ground and I'll say it because affirmations are never enough. It takes over 2,000 repeats of affirmations to actually begin to embody them. (laughs) 2,000, wow. And instead of trying to do thousands of repetitions for affirmations, it's so much better to just come into the present moment, breathe consciously, um, say, huh, now there's this. All right. Wow. Now there's this. You use a lot of breath techniques. Yes. To me, that conscious breathing is one of the pillars of conscious bravery. And conscious breathing is more than just taking a few deep breaths. Any of us can do that. But breathing consciously, we breathe into our whole being, Pat. And so for me, if you and I want to do that together now, and if some of your listeners want to do that with us, it would be lovely. So we can take a deep breath in, breathing into our heart, breathing into our bodies, and then exhale really deeply and hugely into the space around us. And I do this all the time. This has become such an ingrained, embedded practice, not just in the calm moments, but when the devastations occur. And so we practice in these calm moments so that we can do this when we need this breath technique under fire. So breathing in, we're breathing into all six zones of our experience, but we're breathing into our bodies, hearts, minds, our essence, into our intuition, and and exhaling into the energetic space around us, filling that space with self-compassion. So we're breathing in kindness and exhaling tenderness, breathing in strength and exhaling bravery. And that conscious breathing helps me all the time. And it's probably the foundational practice for conscious bravery. You mentioned the six steps. Could you briefly go over them? The six pillars, excuse me. Sure. Well, the six pillars of conscious bravery are befriending all of our feelings, not just the happy ones, not just allowing ourselves to be angry and sad, but also to to allow ourselves to make friends with things like shame 
and guilt. Because as a parent, I've certainly made lots of mistakes and I can ruminate over those and just feel so guilty. But does that do any good? (laughs) Staying stuck in guilt and shame? No. So I want to be able to befriend those feelings and listen to what they have to tell me and then motivate myself to do something different. And so befriending feelings is one, doing conscious breathing. And also another pillar of bravery is becoming comfortable with discomfort and overwhelm. And that's one of the things that has challenged my clients for years. Most of us want to run from our discomfort or our overwhelm. We want to avoid it or we want to fix it right away or we want to say, I'm okay. It's good. But when we can really become comfortable with discomfort, we can actually handle it better. It's weird how we erroneously think that if we're comfortable with our discomfort, that it'll actually mean that we'll have more of it. But the opposite is true. Another pillar of conscious bravery is to know who we truly are, Pat. You know this, having done your your show for years and years. Mm -hmm. You're not just a radio host. You're not just a woman. We're more than our roles or our titles or our skills or our accomplishments. We are our essence. And that could be akin to to saying you're your soul or yourself, but I prefer the elegant word essence because it's less laden with um, misinterpretation. And so it means you have this part of you that is unchanging, that won't fall prey to circumstances. It's who you were before birth and through life and who you'll be into death and beyond. And so that's absolutely essential for us to remember that we are more than our situation, more than our roles. We are our essence. And then another pillar is to live with this, now there's this approach. And the last one is to live with whole being awareness. Whole being awareness means so much more than mindfulness. We want to get away from the ruminations of the mind without dissing the mind. Our minds are important. And so whole being awareness is really what we mean when we say, let's be mindful. Living from our whole beings, we're able to tap into six zones of our experience. And that may sound like a lot, but it's not really because we use all six of these zones of experience whenever we ride a bike or swim Mm -hmm. or have an authentic conversation or have great sex. And so we tap into these six zones, our hearts, our minds, our bodies, our essences. We listen to our intuition and then we tap into this energy space around us. So heart, body, mind, essence, intuition, and the energy around us. And those six zones, when we can tap into those six zones, we can be fully aware. We can live more vibrantly awake. Even if we're devastated at the moment, it doesn't mean that we're all of a sudden going to have this wonderfully easy life. It just means we're going to live with more conscious awareness when we live from our whole being. How do you deal with everybody around you has these accomplished kids and your kids at the moment are having trouble? Why not me? How did you deal with that? Or wasn't it a factor with you? Oh, it was a factor initially. Initially, I longed for my kids to go to college and to have what I guess most people value as successful qualities. But in short order, I saw that longing for what couldn't be and wishing for what wasn't wasn't making me any happier and it wasn't helping them. Putting that on them unconsciously, bringing that into their world, like, huh, when are you going to go back to school? That just puts pressure on them because they want that, but they weren't able to do that. And so I just shift, I had to shift my values to come into our world and the worlds of those we love with non-judgment. And without any expectation to really have hopes, sure, and dreams and to know their capacity, but to disattach from those, to know that, like for me, I had to just know that my sons were going to do what they were going to do in their own time. And when they felt from me that unconditional confidence in them, they did better. How did it work out for your sons, may I ask? It's still a challenge. Mm -hmm. My oldest son is presently diagnosed with schizophrenia. He's trying to recover. He's in a really wonderful home that's kind of a healing home. He's finding his way. And he is just a beautiful being. And so I'm able to really just be with him and have have a lot of fun. And similarly, my younger son has always been athletically gifted. And unfortunately, the impulsivity with along with that got him into trouble. You know, and he would get injured skiing and things like that. But I really have to remind myself all the time that they are who they are. And again, who they are is their essence. It's not their skills and talents, their roles or designations, their jobs, or how, how many A's they've gotten. Who they are is they are these human beings. 
and I write and talk a lot about our human beingness as one of the most important designations we can come back to. And so when I see them as these shining beings that have bumpy paths, yeah. you know, I can embrace it all. And I, I really feel that there's there's a, a flaw in our culture where we think that suffering should just go away, <laughs> yeah. you know, and that it should not be there. So when I am able to see that not just my sons, but even my friends who have kids at Stanford or, or Harvard, they're having their own challenges. They have their own anxiety experiences, or they may have, have gotten raped. Horrible things happen to everyone. And so we really have to have the capacity to be able to reset and refine our balance. And that, to me, involves a high level of consciousness. Mm, uh, w- would you. you like to add anything else as we start wrapping it up? One of the most important things that I've learned in my life is that I need to keep refinding my meaning. And I do that by tapping into what's greater. We want to be connected with ourselves, connected authentically with one another. Like having this conversation with you, Pat, this is just, you're a treasure. You're really a treasure to so so many. (laughs) And so for me to talk with you (laughs) is just a joy. And so this powerful, beautiful triad of connection we have is with ourselves, with one another, and it's with something greater. So I would Mm. encourage people to not only live vibrantly awake with this foundation of contentment and try to maintain that. We can't just wish that these difficult situations will go away. They'll keep coming. So we want to become a master of self-care and really see self-care as absolutely essential to our well-being. That was beautifully said. That was beautifully said. 